Yes. Could you repeat the name of the author? Her name is Susan Jacoby, J-A-C-O-B-B-Y, is that right? Jacoby? Uh, Susan, and it's uh, Never Say Die. And it's, uh, again, when you read it, you're going to be like, why did I get this book? <laughs> but then, right, they're going to agree with us. It's really good. You know, you just have to slog through it. Uh, and, uh, but she doesn't mince words, and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I, you know, because this, the, the you know, sense that, you know, oh, we're going to live longer and we're all going to be happy and healthy and all this uh, is not the reality for most people, certainly not the reality for uh, the clients with whom I work. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, it, it kind of um, hmm, interferes with our ability to assess in a healthy way. Uh, so, you know, so the 85 plus and older uh, group is really at risk. And, um, you know, and we have to really think about that age population. Uh, the second highest rate um, here in this state was 19.2, occurred in those between 45 and 64 years of age. And so, you know, often referred to as middle-aged uh, folks. And then younger groups have had consistently lower suicide rates. In 2014, adolescents and young adults had a suicide rate of about 11.6, which was uh, approximately the national average, uh, uh, too. Uh, but when I talk to particularly older people out in the community who are not professionals, uh, when I say to them, which age group do you think has the highest rate of suicide, uh, they will say uh, young people. Uh, and when I say it's older people, uh, they get kind of uh, cranky and unhappy about that. Uh, so, uh, but I really think it is so crucial to be able to know what's really going on, you know, and then to think about your region, your counties, and how older people are treated, and if they just kind of uh, disappear, uh, and, uh, and people just don't know, you know, what happened to them, or you'll hear people saying, maybe uh, relatives say, oh, I know somebody that lived in this house, and it was an older couple, I don't even know, I haven't seen them in a long time. Uh, but does anybody say, well, let me stop by and say hello? You know, uh, I was telling the group the other day that I was working with some people in a county in, um, I can't even remember which state it was. Uh, it might have been, uh, it was more of a rural state. And uh, what they did, they planned a, a community event where uh, they got young people and, you know, parents and, you know, and uh, professionals involved. And they spent a day for several hours, like from noon till four or something like that, just going around uh, to this uh, r different regions in their county and knocking on doors and just saying hello. And they took with them um, resource guides for older people because what they wanted to do was to try to reach out to older people and or adult children of older people. And one of the numbers was Friendship Line that they had on their uh, brochures. And uh, there had been some people in the uh, community that said, oh, and people are going to get shot and people aren't going to like it. And of course, that never happened. Uh, but they had, and the kids really particularly had a good time in terms of, you know, just seeing, you know, older people that lived in those communities. And, uh, and it was very uh, successful. And I think, you know, uh, communities really need to kind of gather together uh, to see, you know, how can we, you know, uh, access older people and just even to give them resource numbers. Uh, I think that that can be uh, a very helpful way to do an intervention. Um, and then what we're also seeing is that rates, uh, certainly among uh, white people, uh, continue to be high, certainly high in Oregon and across the country. Uh, but the second highest rate, 10.9, was for uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives. So we also want to think about um, older people in our communities that are, um, you know, uh, um, are minorities, the Native Americans, uh, Asian Americans, Hispanic. Uh, and we're also seeing a very uh, strong growth in uh, the older adults in these minority groups, that there is a tremendous growth. Uh, by 2030, I think the U.S. Census uh, has said that, you know, for example, the Hispanic population of people 65 plus uh, is going to increase by like 300 uh, percent for the uh, Asian American population something like maybe a 200% increase of people 65 plus. And so I think we have to really look at um, 
you know, what we know about, um, what we know about older people from these different uh, communities. And uh, also in terms of um, method of death, uh, firearms is the most common method of death by suicide, accounting for a little less than half of all suicide deaths, 49.9% uh, um, in the state of Oregon. The next most common method was suffocation, including hangings and uh, poisoning. Uh, so, and that's pretty standard across the country. Uh, you probably were uh, aware in August 2014 that Robin Williams, the actor, uh, had died by suicide and he was uh, 63 and he hung himself. Uh, and here's a gentleman that had all kinds of resources, uh, uh, all these people, everybody said, oh, I loved Robin Williams and yet he died alone. His wife was in the house, but she had gone out and he was found by his secretary. Uh, and so a lot of older people say to me, if someone like Robin Williams would kill himself and he had so much, I have nothing or very little. Yes? Because Oregon is a, you know, they have the option of putting themselves to death as well. Are these numbers including any of those? No. Because yeah. Yeah, these numbers don't include those. Um, now, California is the fifth state that has an end-of-life option act uh, that now has gone into effect July 1st. And uh, so those numbers would be separate. Uh, they wouldn't be in the suicide uh, category. And, and, and that's important, too. I do have some information in the handout uh, about, um, you know, right to die, uh, which is a different category. You know, when people say to me, well, you're suicide prevention, Patrick, so you must be against right to die. And, and I say, well, I, I wouldn't make that assumption if I were you, because I think that's a very different category. Uh, there's a criteria. California has that. Vermont has it. Uh, Washington State has it. Oregon has it. Uh, Montana, I think their, their uh, initiative is now going back into the courts to get decided. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's important. I think self-determination is important, particularly um, if you have a terminal illness and six months to live uh, and you want to have some quality life. How many of you have read the book Being Mortal? And of those hands up, how many would say that is a good book to read? Yeah, Being Mortal, I think it was a fantastic book. Uh, and that's by uh, Dr. Gawande. His last name is spelled G-A-W. A-N-D-E, uh, Being Mortal, and uh, there's also an accompanying film uh, about that too uh, that was on PBS or KQED, and uh, some of you might have seen it. We've been uh, doing a lot of talks uh, where I facilitate discussions after viewing the film uh, with people. Uh, in several locations where I've shown the film, we had 350 people, uh, most of whom were um, uh, people over the age of 60 uh, or their adult children. Uh, came to see that. And Dr. Gawande says, and I really agree with him, which is endings matter. You know, how your life is going to end really matters. And uh, that if you think, uh, and he says this in the film, that your physician is going to lead the charge in terms of, you know, how your life is going to go uh, when you're very ill, he said, you're choosing the wrong person. Uh, you need to be in charge, you know, of, of your, you know, uh, future and you need to be very careful uh, when the physician says, well, there's a one in a million chance that this new chemotherapy uh, is going to give you some more time. Uh, and then you take this, this treatment and now you're sicker than what you were before and you're not able even to communicate because you're so darn tired that you can't even have a conversation. Just opening your eyes might be too much. Uh, but people do this. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Swimming in the Sea of Death that I also recommend. And it's by um, uh, Susan, it's about Susan Sontag and it's by her son, David Reese. Uh, swimming in the sea of death and his mother and you might remember her she was quite uh, uh, well known and her cancer came back when she was older and uh, she had been a Buddhist and all this but she refused to see her Buddhist friends uh, and she was going to hold on to any hope uh, that she was going to live and he had said to one of her doctors 
uh, after she was uh, requested to take this bone marrow transplant. She lived in New York, but this was in uh, Seattle. And, uh, you know, and he said to the doctor, he said, we know that my mother is not going to survive this. Uh, so why are you telling her? And she went to <coughs> Seattle to get this uh, bone marrow transplant. And uh, he said, well, there's a one in a million chance. And he said, saying that to my mother, who, if you ever knew anything about her, had features, I would think, of narcissism. And, uh, and so if you said to her, there's a one in a million chance, she actually thought, I'm one in a million. Uh, but the truth was, as Dr. Gawandia said, that we don't tell the truth as physicians because we see death as the enemy and we feel like we fail. Uh, so we're going to do treatment after treatment, uh, even if you are exhausted. And, and that's why, I, well, the book is so good uh, because he also talks about the importance of hospice. He talks about uh, the importance of end of life, uh, right to die. Uh, and I, I really support his uh, vision. And as a physician, I really supported him when he said to this one gentleman after his wife had died, she just had a baby and she had cancer, it was a mess. And uh, he said, uh, you know, when we did those last treatments, he said, I knew they weren't going to be very helpful. And the husband said, oh, you colluded with us in thinking that she might recover because she wanted, you know, to have the baby as long as she could. And, uh, and as it turned out, she was so weak from these chemotherapies uh, that she couldn't even hold the baby. Uh, and she delivered the baby. She had to deliver it naturally uh, bec uh, because her lung collapsed and they couldn't do a C-section. And so it was a really painful birth. And, uh, and then she never really got to bond with the baby because of all these uh, uh, treatments. And, and when he said, oh, you colluded with me, the husband said, and Dr. Gawande said, and I lied to you. So I think it is important that we think about that uh, with older people uh, and, and who is kind of, uh, you know, helping them. Uh, you have this uh, 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 chart in your um, handouts. And this is looking at death rates per 100,000, uh, all injuries, suicide, all races, ethnic ethnicities, et cetera, uh, in the state of Oregon. And so uh, you can uh, look at that. Um, but as I said, suicide rates have been continuing to rise. Between 1979 and 2000, uh, we saw a decline in the rates of suicide. Uh, but during these next 11 years and then continuing noticeably since 2007, as we said, with the financial stress on uh, people, particularly middle-aged men, uh, those suicide rates have um, continued to uh, increase. And so we want to be, you know, just kind of thoughtful uh, about this and, and why I think that we all, any one of us, can intervene uh, with somebody that is ideating suicide. Uh, we just have to be able uh, to communicate with them more effectively. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's very possible. Uh, older adults continue to be at highest risk of suicide. You know, for example, uh, Dr. Conwell, he's in your reference list. Uh, you know, if you are wanting to do, if, for, if you're students and you want to do some uh, more research in terms of older adults and suicide, Dr. Conwell is definitely the person that you want to uh, connect with. Um, he's uh, also very approachable. I've given talks with him. Uh, we both were presenting at a uh, American Psychiatric Association national conference. And, and this was really amazing um, that I was walking through the uh, group. And, and, and psychiatrists, uh, for whatever reason, there's a gender imbalance. It's mostly men. And there were certainly some women. Uh, but it was really the bulk of them were men. And uh, I was on a panel with Dr. Conwell, and we were talking about older adults and suicide. And I was talking about Friendship Line as a resource and, and how that could be helpful to psychiatrists. And, uh, and then he was talking more about the research. And we were both kind of walking through the group uh, to go to the stage, and people didn't recognize us. And what they were saying was just outrageous. Uh, a number of them were saying, oh, you know, who needs this talk on older people and suicide? You know, if they're going to think about it, they're going to do it, and who cares? You know, um, and Dr. Conwell, I mean, I, you know, because I do all my work in the community, and he could see that I was, like, unhappy. And I thought, I'm going to talk to these people? Yeah. They're not my people. Um, 
And, uh, and he kind of nudged me and said, Patrick, this is even more reason why we're here, because they don't want us here. Uh, but we're here, and we're going to talk about this. So just kind of, you're coming with me. And, uh, and, and we did. And you could see they were so disinterested. You know, and talk about cell phone mania. Uh, they were busy on their cell phones. Um, but, but again, I just think we have to be very thoughtful about who's calling the shots. Uh, and if your older parent is with a, uh, a professional who really doesn't care about older people, we've got to think about that. Uh, one of the problems in this country, and some of you probably know this, uh, is that I think we're about 27 or 20,000 uh, geriatricians short in this country. Um, and then, as I said, we have this, this expanding number of older people. Uh, and yet, we don't have a corresponding number of people that are moving into uh, geriatric medicine. We're also seeing uh, uh, smaller numbers of social workers and you know, other professionals uh, who are choosing, choosing to work in, in um, uh, the field of aging. Uh, I, I teach part-time at UC Berkeley in the School of Social Welfare. And when I was giving, uh, when I was invited to do guest lectures, uh, back in the you know, 80s and 90s, uh, there might be 30 or, or maybe even more, 35 uh, uh, social workers who were in the geriatric track. And uh, the last several times I taught there, uh, there were six, six, maybe seven. Well, you know, going back to geriatricians, there's no, there's no glory, there's no profitability. Right. That's right. Well, let me just say that so that they get that. As that she said that there's no, you know, uh, again, profitability in this because we're not going to cure aging. And so, you know, is there an incentive here for people to go into geriatrics? Go ahead. For me personally, it's because I do enjoy working with older people. Yeah. And she does enjoy working with older people. And that's what I'm hoping uh, that there are a lot of converts here today uh, who really choose and want and to strengthen their skills uh, in terms of working with older people. And, and also, I think it's really insurance about the future, because I would sure like when I'm old um, that I have people that are really interested in aging, you know, and so that I can feel kind of safe if I've got health problems, which I will, you know, of some kind. Uh, and, uh, and I would really hope that people would care. Uh, I'm dubious. Uh, about that, uh, but I, I try to inspire people to get involved in aging. Uh, when I started off in 1973, people said, oh, Patrick, you picked the great profession because, you know, there's going to be so much money and there's going to be so much need and blah, blah, blah. And in 2016, people were saying to me, gee, you chose the right profession because one day you're going to, you know, really make some money and it's going to be really helpful. Uh, uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, uh, but I really love older people, uh, and I love working with them, and, uh, and uh, even when it gets difficult. Uh, but I'm just always glad that myself or someone like you uh, is willing to say, I'll, I'll talk to that older person, uh, and uh, that can be very helpful. You know, uh, the baby boomers carry with them substantially higher suicide rates than preceding or subsequent cohorts. So um, for, again, when you're working with people now, I think, what is it, since January 2011, uh, eight to 10,000 uh, baby boomers are turning 65 every day. You know, and my cohort, no offense to people who were born in that age group, uh, I don't think they're really thrilled uh, <laughs> with marching into older age. Uh, and, and so how we know that is because, you know, even when I turn 60, you know, and I, I, my friends are people like yourselves in aging, social workers or whatever, uh, gerontologists, and uh, my birthday is right around Christmas, and so uh, we met before then, and I said, oh, since we're here together, I said I really wanted to talk about turning 60 in a couple of days, um, you know, because, you know, when you're working in the field of aging, you're aging in the aging field, you know, it brings up stuff, and I just wanted to talk about it. And one of my friends leaped up and said, oh, but Patrick, you look fine. 
And I thought, well, I said, I'm 59 and I'll be 60 in a couple of days. I don't think a lot of things will change, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then somebody else said, oh, but Patrick, keep in mind, 60 is the new 40. And, uh, you know, and as I say to people, I'm 68. For those of you in your 40s, this ain't it, you know. Uh, <laughs> I am really clear about that, that 68 is 68. Uh, it's not 48. Uh, but that little deceptive trick uh, grabs people, you know. Uh, and then, you know, what we do is that we find ourselves competing with people who are 20 years younger than I am. Uh, I won't do that, you know. I, I say all the time my age, even though I also follow that with yikes, uh, because it always surprises me. But that's where I'm at, you know. Uh, and it's okay. What I have to do is pay attention. You know, on this uh, trip, I have to watch the fact that I get tired, you know. Uh, I'm not 48. And even though I love being here, you know, it's like after leaving here and then driving for three and a half hours, when I get there, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm tired. Uh, uh, but I'm still effective. And so I want to continue. But, but I'm not going to compete with 40-year-olds, you know. Uh, and I think that that is so deceptive. And I see my, my cohort grabbing onto that and, and holding on to youth. It really impoverishes what older age means. And, and I'm banking on older age being a time, as Dr. Uh, uh, Eric Erickson would say, um, a time when we can really get to the point where we actually feel some wisdom. Uh, and, and I see that already, not the wise part. I'm, I'm hoping to get some of that. Uh, it's like climbing one of those, those outrageous mountains you have around here. Uh, and, uh, but I can see the, the combination of experience and knowledge. And how over time, I just feel like there's a, a distilling process uh, that will you know, uh, move me into the direction of wisdom. And I see so many of my older adults, whether they are academically trained or just trained in life, uh, that they have this wisdom about them uh, that really intrigues and impresses me. But I also see what Dr. Conwell's talking about is the despair, you know, uh, that they need some encouragement, some support, some love, some, you know, uh, connection. Connections, again, are what bind us to uh, life. Uh, and this is just, again, just talking about these rates of uh, suicide among um, minority groups. Um, and I wasn't sure in some of your counties if you have people from uh, the Asian or Pacific Islander group. Uh, there's a concern about their rates of suicide. Uh, Asian American women, the Center for Disease Control, are concerned about uh, how there are very subtle increases in suicide rates among Asian American women and uh, wanted to just acknowledge that. Uh, and so, uh, as I said earlier, you know, um, younger people have far more uh, suicide attempts uh, than older people. The ratio of attempts to completed acts of suicide with uh, older people is four to one, uh, meaning that older people are far less ambivalent uh, about uh, dying uh, than younger counterparts. And uh, so that's a concern. And so when we do you know, an assessment uh, with older uh, people and they say, you know, um, I feel like I'm a burden to my family or um, I'm, um, life isn't worth living or people would be better off without me, uh, I take that really seriously. Uh, because you know, uh, if a younger person maybe jumps out of a three-story building they might survive because they're strong or healthy. Um, but if a 79-year-old person throws themselves out of a three-story window, uh, they could easily die, or their life would be, if they lived, they might be 10,000 times worse off uh, than they would have been had they uh, uh, tried a different uh, uh, method. Uh, but I wanted to um, share with you, as I said, a uh, suicide note. And this was given to me by a daughter of a, uh, her father who had uh, killed himself. He was in his late 70s. Mm -hmm. And she, um, you know, we work with a lot of families, um, daughters, sons, uh, grandchildren. Uh, and I, I want to emphasize again, one of the 
hidden populations of folks that really, really need our consideration, our survivors of people who have uh, taken their own lives. Uh, the other group are family caregivers of uh, older people that may have features of dementia or Parkinson's or a combination of, uh, of chronic health issues. Um, and that's why Friendship Line has always um, been a resource uh, for uh, caregivers as well. Uh, but she had uh, come into the group, and, uh, and, and I speak this to those of you who are daughters, uh, because I think that uh, uh, boys, men, don't see it the same way. She saw herself as daddy's little girl. She had two um, other siblings, both uh, boys. And, you know, and she was married and had two children. Uh, but she said uh, to me that part of the blow that she felt with her dad's death is that nobody knew that this was happening. And, uh, and in the suicide note, and he left a couple notes pinned on his body, uh, but they mostly had to do with his uh, uh, checkbooks and you know, finances and things like that, uh, and notes to his wife uh, with uh, numbers of his bank book and whatever, whatever. And, uh, but this one had a little bit more of a personal um, feeling to it, uh, but he never mentioned her or his sons or the grandchildren or really his wife uh, in uh, any of those notes. And she said, uh, I always believed I was daddy, daddy's little girl. And she said, it's not to think that I didn't realize that I'm a grown woman and he's a grown man, but she said, I always felt we had this special connection uh, that for her was very meaningful. Uh, and she said, when she discovered that, she, that he had killed himself, uh, she said it, it made her think that maybe this was all in my imagination, uh, that if I was really daddy's little girl, he would have called me. He would have said, how can I leave you? Or how can I leave your mother? Or how could I leave your children, you know, the grandchildren? Uh, but he didn't. But this is what he wrote, and I just would um, ask you to think about as I read this, you know, how this makes you feel. And, and part of the reason that she wanted me to um, read these, uh, this suicide note, as she knows the work I do, and she said, and Patrick, it this way, I know that maybe his death has some meaning, uh, that maybe people are gonna hear this and recognize someone that they know uh, that might have similar, similar kinds of issues. And, and just maybe uh, my dad's death wouldn't be in vain. Uh, so his note said, uh, the note to you on my body is mainly for the sheriff so I can get disposed of quickly. Please don't let them try to revive me. I'm using the gun only because it's the only sure way to not be rescued. Confidential wisdom, a conventional wisdom is that no one wants to die, but I do. After looking at the future, I am boxed in on health. I just can't face going to the hospital anymore, being a prisoner in the hands of courteous and well-meaning bureaucrats who are totally subservient to doctor's orders. I have no quarrel with the doctors. They patch us up and work hard and develop skills to keep us going. But there comes a time when the medical knowledge is insufficient to do much good to someone like me who is old, plagued with so many physical problems that the patch up requires continuing fears of loss of control over oneself to pass on of one's own wishes. Continued operations have dragged me down to where partial recovery is the only future, never quite recovering from the last one and fearing a whole series of deteriorating probes, surgeries as a necessary diagnostic tool, but only temporary solutions to the immediate problem. Doctors do a great job. It's what they are trained to do. They are not infallible and we expect too much of them. Ethics prohibit them from really looking at the patient as an independent whole person, and rightfully so, nobody should play God. When the physical side is deteriorating rapidly and the mental deterioration is setting in, and when coupled with all the economical losses in the last couple of years, I am a detriment to you, the family, and society in general. I am very ashamed of ending up a poor provider. I hope you can avoid publicity. No funeral, please. It's bad enough to know that I have been a failure at practically everything. So what were you experiencing as you were um, hearing this uh, note? Somebody. Yes. 
Yeah, increased heartbeat. We can feel that heart chakra really opening, right? Uh, what else? Temporary fatality with a long range solution. Yeah, that. The fatality is that it can be fleeting and if you work with it over long enough, you see a storm will come in and twist in and drift out. Yeah. So, um, a lot of you know, the fact that he wrote it down in such detail. And all referred to today. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, this gentleman was just saying about the, you know, um, how this storm kind of sweeps in and sweeps out. Uh, and see, and that's, that's, I think that's very important insight. Uh, but sometimes when the, swarm, the, 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 the storm sweeps in, uh, it's internal. And we can't see it. Uh, and then something like this happens. Um, what else did, were you thinking? It reminded me of It reminded you of your father and that it sounded like him? Wow. Is he still alive, your father? No. He did not. He did not. Okay. But, uh, but he did all not. All the things were things that he said uh, in his later years. Yeah, feeling like a failure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, just how culturally driven Well, and, and I think you're right that, that the cultural issue here happens to do with economics. You know, I uh, feel like I've been a poor provider. I failed you, my family, and I failed society in general uh, by being a poor provider. And, and, you know, the interesting thing about the physician is when the daughter read the note and she went to his primary care physician, um, and his primary care physician was also a friend of his, and I advise people, I don't think your physician should be your friend, you know, uh, but they golf together. And he said, oh, and they knew that he had a couple um, surgeries. They were concerned about uh, uh, polyps. Well, they were concerned about cancer, colon cancer, but it turned out that's not what he had. And they were also concerned about um, some problems uh, in terms of cancer and his pancreas. But, uh, they were just watching this. They, they didn't feel that he had any um, problems. Uh, uh, Dr. Conwell has talked about uh, people uh, that even though they've had reassurance that they really don't have cancer, you know, that, that, but they're watching, making sure, you know, we're just gonna have to, you're gonna have to come in every six months or whatever it is. But people have died by suicide waiting for the results even though the re results were uh, not positive. They didn't have cancer. Uh, and uh, have killed themselves, older men. Uh, so, uh, but he said, I, I, he said, as she read him this letter, he said, I don't think it's written by him. Somebody else wrote it because he said, we weren't planning a whole lot of probes. We weren't planning any of this. Uh, that this wasn't accurate. You know, there were two, you know, uh, what he would call probes to try to identify if there were problems. But he said, we didn't have a lot of surgeries planned. And he was still working part-time as a lawyer. He was a lawyer. And uh, the family had not suffered any uh, problems uh, financially. He had lost some money in the mm, commodities market, uh, but not, an, I mean, it was barely noticeable. His family was well provided for. Uh, so the daughter was really confused about what, what her dad was thinking. But the, his wife, uh, the mother, uh, the two sons and herself, had no idea that he was suffering and perceiving himself in such a negative way. Uh, behind you. Um, what I heard was a lot of shame, self-shame, and lack of purpose and meaning. Yeah, a lot of shame and a lot of lack of purpose. Um, but he was, he was, I think as you had said, this storm was, I, I am feeling that I'm not a good provider. I feel like I have failed. Um, and yet, the evidence doesn't support that. And what does that sound like to you? What does it sound like he was going through? Depression. Yeah, doesn't that sound like depression? When the evidence looks one way, and yet your perception of it is a negative view, 
you know, that one would, you know, kind of ponder that maybe this person is feeling depressed. Uh, but what is so troubling about it, the daughter, nobody knew that he was depressed, you know. And, and that is really disturbing when we think that men are overrepresented, overrepresented in the suicide stat, stats anyway, particularly older men. If you go to the 85 plus age group, you know, it's alarming how many older men are in that category. Uh, so something is, uh, something is going on. Uh, there's a classic book that some of you might have read, but I still think it's worthwhile reading. It's by Terence Real, R-E-A-L and it's called I Don't Want to Talk About It. Uh, and now, right, isn't that a great title? I know the women in this room understand that title so well. Uh, and, uh, and the men have probably said this at different times, which is, you know, the, the, your wife or daughter or somebody says, you know, hey, we really need to talk about, you know, um, you know uh, granddad and grandma. Uh, they are not going to be able to live uh, by themselves uh, in that big house for much longer. Uh, and your dad or your uh, husband or brother, somebody's going to say, well, I don't want to talk about that right now. And if you persist, what happens next? What's the next phase of I don't want to talk about it? Anger, right? Anger. And, and, and that's going to silence you. You know, when I'm with these older men and, you know, I'll go into the home to do a, a uh, a visit and uh, the daughter or the mother or wife will say to me, oh, whatever you do, don't upset him. Don't ask him about alcohol. He'll get really mad. And I'll say, uh, it's okay if he gets mad. And then he gets mad because I talk about these things and he's furious and I just, I'm a good waiter. I can just sit and wait. I love that kind of experience because I like to kind of, you know, Mm, allow myself to kind of get a sense of what is really going on with this person. And of course he's mad, but the thing about people that get really angry, uh, they have to take a big breath at a certain point because they can't breathe anymore. And that's when I strike, you know. And, uh, and as they're, they're getting their breath back and I say something very simple like, uh, I see you're really angry. Well, well that ignites them again. Uh, <laughs> And then I just wait again. And then I say, oh, you're really, really angry. I get it, you know. Do you need to let me know more about that? Uh, and then they usually, you know, calm down. And I said, I know you're trying to silence me, but remember, I'm not a member of your family. I didn't buy into this dynamic. So I'm just going to wait it out and I'm going to ask you some questions, you know. I'm concerned. They're concerned. Is it okay to have somebody concerned about you? Uh, which is very, I think, quite simple, uh, but really hard. I work with a lot of uh, older men who are in 12-step programs, uh, primarily uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, this one guy was very interesting. It's just, he uh, has also attempted suicide and he's, he's much, much better now. And uh, he's in his early 60s. And, you know, and what I do is I, I get attached, you know, I'm already getting attached to all of you, so just keep that in mind. Uh, when we end, you just think, oh, I've just had this talk with this person from wherever. And, uh, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I love these people, you know. Uh, and, and I'm in that car driving who knows where uh, and uh, feeling all lonely. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I get attached and so I say to these guys, how much I love them. And I, I mean it, I, I mean, you know, in an agape sense, not in a romantic sense. You know, just what you feel for older people or younger pe people, and I'm just, the fact that we're all still alive is amazing to me. Uh, and so I just love people. And this one guy, uh, wonderful person, he said, uh, I decided, because he likes that, that I say I love him too. And, uh, and he'll send, you know, if he has to send me an email or a text, or so, he always ends it with, uh, love you, Patrick, or something like that. And then he said, I decided to tell some of my male friends. And he said he told his best friend that he went to school, grammar school, high school, community college with, and he was feeling down. And he said, I just wanted to call him and say uh, how much I love him. So he said, I called the guy and left him a voicemail he didn't pick up. And he said, I just want to tell you how much I love you and how important you are in my life and the life of his family, you know, both families. And he said uh, he was surprised that the guy didn't text or call back. And uh, he said, uh, finally, the guy called. And, uh, and this was like weeks later. 
And uh, this, the, my client was feeling very concerned. And he said to the guy, he said, oh, gee, I'm surprised you didn't call me sooner. And he said, well, why is that? He said, well, I thought you would call me because I told you for the first time in my life, I told you that I love you, you know, you're my best friend. And he said, uh, I don't want to talk about that. Have a good day. And so my client said to me, maybe that love thing, Patrick, uh, isn't reserved for male friends. And, uh, you know, it's just something to uh, uh, think about. Um, but that uh, suicide note, I think, brings up uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about. Uh, this feeling of shame. Dr. Edwin Schneidman, who is the father of the suicide prevention movement in the United States, has said, when people feel shame, uh, that can be a risk factor uh, for suicide. Shame, you know, um, I, I, in some of the talks I've given over the years, uh, gee, I feel warm all of a sudden. Thank you, whoever turned the heat on. Um, it's, I was cold. We might have to turn, yeah. I was cold, I don't know about that. Uh, but now I'm like, oh, this feels like 97 degrees outside. Um, I'm getting used to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, but shame, you know, I, I used to do a talk where I would talk about the difference between guilt and shame. And I would have the participants think of a time in their life when they felt guilt and uh, they were to turn to somebody and talk about that. Uh, and then after they did the thing on guilt, then I would have them do the thing on shame. Think about a time in your life when you felt ashamed or embarrassed about something, you know, that you could talk about, just to have the experience of doing that. And uh, people rebelled. They would do the guilt thing, but they wouldn't do the shame one. Uh, and, and that said a lot to me, you know, these are professionals. And, uh, and I said, isn't it interesting, though, that we want to probe um, into uh, our clients, you know, uh, and certainly to feel ashamed, just as he said, you know, I feel that, you know, I'm very ashamed of being a poor provider. Uh, shame, as you were saying, is a huge part of this man's experience. And, uh, and, you know, we have to really ask ourselves again in terms of countertransference, you know, how comfortable am I talking about that uh, 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 with, uh, older people. Uh, and, and I think it is challenging. I think it is tough um, uh, to do that because I think countertransference <laughs> triggers in some of my own shame uh, and I might have some difficulty uh, with that. So I think it's worthwhile to uh, talk about. Um, so what is it in terms of the uh, uh, propensity for older people to die from suicide? Well, because they're often frailer than young people, as I said. Uh, there's less opportunity for rescue, and he said that. The reason I'm using the gun is because I want to avoid being rescued, you know. Uh, he's really saying that uh, I have very low ambivalence about whether I want to live. I really want to die. Conventional wisdom is that most people want to live, but I don't. I want to die. Uh, uh, more lethal means he used the gun and greater intention to die. Uh, you know, the suicide notes that I have the privilege to read, you know, are very, very uh, uh, similar in, in this kind of content. Uh, that families often say, again, they didn't mention me, they didn't say they loved me. Uh, that, that's uh, often the case if it's a male writing the suicide note. Uh, most of the suicide notes that I've, I've gathered over the years where uh, families will give me those suicide notes, oftentimes it'll just be one sentence, too much pain goodbye. It's not your fault. Too much pain. Goodbye. Uh, and and, uh, and I, I think we have to really figure out how to help people develop a vocabulary uh, for talking about pain. Yes, psychological pain. Go ahead. Yeah, just one of the things that I would add to this is what I talk about this a lot is lack of purpose Yeah. Right. Lack of purpose and meaning. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we're all challenged by that in terms of how do we engage older people in the community. And, and one of the things that we find with our call-out service, we have a lot of young people, you know, who are in um, 
uh, bachelor's programs and they're trying to figure out do they want to go into counseling or whatever. And, uh, and, and so they call out to these uh, older individuals and they form these really important relationships uh, where these younger people really understand for maybe the first time what it's like to really engage an older person as a person, not as old person, you know, but somebody that I really actually have things in common with, you know. Uh, nobody has the corner on sorrow, you know. Uh, so when, when older people will say uh, to younger volunteers, and I always prep them for this, older callers are going to say something like, what do you know about old people's problems? Somebody said that to me last week when I answered the phone for somebody, and they said, what do you know about old people's problems? And I said, well, I might not know everything, but I know something. Well, you sound so young. And I said, well, I might sound young, but I'm not young. Oh, yes, you are. Don't lie to me. I mean, and so they were making all these assumptions, you know. And I said, you know, uh, don't let that throw you off. What you want to say is, I said to this person, I said, you know, I may be younger than you. I don't know. Um, but I said, I think we've all shared sorrow. We've all shared disappointments. We've all had problems in our lives. And as you're saying, you know, and we've lost our way sometimes, you know. Uh, we have that in common. And he said, well, he said, I'm going to talk to you, but I think you're probably in your 30s. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not, you know. Um, but anyway, but he did talk to me. But I think we have to think of how we engage uh, uh, people. And, and that's why the friendship line, when we do these outreach calls, that's really part of the reason, is that, that, that I think it's very important for older people to feel like somebody wants to know about them. You know, um, and I think one of the purposes of being older is to reflect, you know, uh, and to think about, you know, what your life has been about, you know, has your life had some meaning, but also if you've had problems along the way, it's good to be able to address them. You might not have been able to talk about them at the age of 50, um, but now at 80, maybe you can talk about it with somebody uh, that respects your confidentiality, uh, but also really wants to talk to you. I, I really love the link between older people and younger people, that intergenerational connection, uh, which they might not have uh, with their grandchildren. Some people do have much better relationships with their grandchildren than they do with their adult children. Uh, but I think that can be on the road uh, 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 to you know, finding a, a different sense of purpose. Uh, I try to also get uh, older people to come and be peer volunteers uh, on the lines. Um, we have, fortunately, we're really blessed that we have a number of uh, people over the age of 60 that really want to work at Friendship Line. Uh, we have a group of people who are living in a retirement center, and although uh, they're not right there in San Francisco, uh, they were saying the same thing, that they just feel like what they do is that they go to meals a lot and drink a lot of wine. You know, that's what they do. Uh, and they said, I think that our life has something more to offer than just that. So what they're doing is that we've trained them to make outgoing calls uh, to these older people, but they don't have to come into the office. We have a supervisor who's working with them on the phone. And so uh, that's giving them you know, a sense of direction and purpose. But I, I see that a lot of people who are more middle class and upper who are older, they sure do spend a lot of time entertaining themselves. Uh, and, and I don't think that that necessarily is bringing them meaning. You know? So I think it's something we have to always look at. Uh, somebody else have a comment? Yes. I work as a hospice chaplain every day. I engage over people like that. And I met Rosie the Riveter the other day. Okay. She's one of these gals that work in World War II that had a small butt. And so they put her inside the wings of the 52 and she even bought ribbons. And oh. we thought that she's 94, I think. Yeah. And then we began to talk about all kinds of stuff, dating and mating, dying. And I love people. Yeah. They really have so much to tell. And that's their purpose, to share wisdom. That's right. See, what he's talking about is the, the purpose that they have is to share their wisdom, their experiences. Uh, we can talk about dying and that that gives somebody purpose. And I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, but what we have to do is be able to listen 
to be able to listen. Uh, the lament of older people, even when I was new in the field of aging, was if somebody would just listen to me. Uh, and I'm still hearing the same thing. What I want is somebody to listen to me. They don't have to tell me what to do. I don't necessarily need somebody to tell me what to do, you know, because I'm here 80 years or 90 years, I kind of know what to do. Uh, but I want somebody to hear me. And who wants to hear me? Uh, um, May Sarton, some of you might be familiar with her. She was huge in the 1970s and 80s with Ani East Nin and writers like that, uh, uh, and uh, Henry Miller. And uh, she has written many, 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 she was quite prolific and wrote poetry and books. And uh, her most uh, well-known book was uh, A Journal of a Solitude. Does, how many people remember May Sarton? Ish. You know, uh, what is it? so funny how quickly we forget people. I said the other day to a group of people, how many of you uh, know uh, Dr. Robert Butler? How many here know Dr. Robert Butler? Eeks, thank you. I knew you would. Yes, some of you do. Well, Dr. Robert Butler was the only person to have received a Pulitzer Prize for a nonfiction book on aging, and it was called Why Survive Growing Old in America. And he was a, a, a pioneer, a crucial, uh, 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 person in the field of aging. He coined the term ageism. Uh, and so for all of you interested in aging, I would say, uh, please Google him. We need to know that. But, but uh, don't uh, you know, uh, beat yourself up about not knowing him. Everywhere I go, and I say people, I just think we need to remember Dr. Robert Butler. And uh, people don't know. There'll be a couple people that will. Uh, but you'll be so proud of yourself when this happens again, because somebody's going to say to you, oh, do you know Robert Butler? And you're going to say, I sure do. You know, and uh, I'll be so proud. Uh, and, uh, but uh, May Sarton, had, there's a beautiful film called May Sarton, Old Age is a Foreign Country. And in this film, she's had two strokes. She's in her 80s, early 80s. And she said, you know, um, what people want to do is that they want to tell me what to do. Uh, they say, May Sarton, you can't live alone. Uh, and she said, I keep saying to them that, that uh, uh, solitude is my great love. I'm not myself unless I am alone. Uh, that's when I can really feel myself. And, and she said, what I want is someone to listen to me. But nobody does. And she was amazingly well known. Uh, and, and she said nobody would listen to her. Uh, and so you can imagine if you were somebody in a rural part of the, the, the state uh, where you didn't have a lot of friends and, and you had been a worker bee all your life. Uh, and, uh, and that is anybody going to take the time to be interested in you? Uh, so when you say, I love old people, that's what I'm really hoping uh, that everyone is uh, going to be feeling is that love for older adults. Uh, I just want to be aware of the time because we're going to be taking a break in a minute. We said 10.30, right? Okay. See, once I get revved up, then it's like time goes out the window and I'm just kind of uh, into it. Uh, so we want to be aware of the role of psych psychiatric illness, uh, uh, particularly depression. Uh, but we don't know as much with older people in terms of uh, symptoms of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, uh, delusional disorder. You know, uh, we really just don't know um, the degree to which uh, these other disorders impact uh, uh, the ideation of suicide in older people. You know, keeping in mind that we don't recognize depression, uh, let alone some of these other kinds of mental health issues. Uh, you know, and that's what Terence Real says in his book, I Don't Want to Talk About It, which he writes about male depression and how uh, everyone colludes into not recognizing it. And he said, you know, if we don't recognize overt depression in men, how in the heck are we going to notice covert depression? Uh, and, and he posits that professionals, mental health professionals, uh, collude uh, with men in that they're not depressed. Uh, they just need to get busy, take action, write a book, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's something that we really want to uh, think about. You know, again, the prediction of suicide is a complex, difficult task. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of personal demographics that we want to be able to kind of weave into this, uh, psychiatric problems. Uh, another area that's very difficult uh, to treat in older people are symptoms of personality disorders, 
uh, particularly narcissism or histrionic or uh, borderline. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I find this no matter where I go, uh, that, that people with older people that might have symptoms of these personality disorders are just you know, not recognized as such. Uh, and, uh, and how difficult that is, and we don't know to the degree uh, that these personality issues, um, again, complicate the picture in terms of uh, mental health or quality of life. Uh, Dr. Robert Kastenbaum uh, has suggested that suicide is always in the back of the mind of older people. He's a researcher from uh, Arizona State University, and, uh, you know, and he tries to say you know, that myth that if we bring up suicide, uh, that uh, somebody's then going to say, okay, now I have the idea to do it. And of course, that's a myth. And if you're taking any suicide prevention 101, uh, that often uh, is uh, debunked uh, during that. And, and so we want to be aware of stressful life events that get in the way of an older person's ability, capacity to really think things through clearly. Um, and, uh, and that's where, again, depression uh, can interfere. Uh, with their ability to think clearly. Prolonged illness, we were talking about financial stress, relationship problems. Uh, one of the things that's so difficult for a lot of older people is uh, that the, the negative dynamics in their families continue to operate, and yet the older person now is quite ill or, or just weary, uh, but they're dragged into these very difficult uh, uh, family relationships that just continue to repeat, 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 uh, but there's no uh, change uh, uh, in them. Uh, this is just, this slide is just acknowledging that, uh, you know, there's a, 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 oftentimes a little bit more information that we're seeing in the news about suicide. Uh, certainly we see far more about homicide uh, than we do uh, suicide, uh, but there are uh, news items about that. And we'll take our break in just a minute, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, what's happening globally in terms of mental health. Uh, and when we look at the global situation, none of these stats are gonna surprise you. There is such turmoil in so many countries uh, across the globe. I mean, you wonder, I mean, what's happening to older people and infants, toddlers, you know, kids? Uh, in some of these war-torn uh, countries. I mean, every time I hear about Syrian refugees, you know, I just think, what? I mean, we, it's, it, it's almost hard to let it in, uh, but when you see some of the photographs and you see these little kids, you know, uh, and, and maybe their parents or whoever is taking care of them, this is not something that's going to be erased from their minds. You know, and if they do get integrated into another uh, culture, another country, are they going to get treatment for this trauma? You know, what's happening to those older adults who are going to try to set up a new life somewhere? I, I, I just have enormous empathy uh, uh, for people. Globally, there's an estimated 350 million people of all ages, all ages that suffer from depression. Uh, 350 million. And at its worst, depression can lead to suicide. Over 800,000 people die due to suicide every year. Over 800,000, 800,000, that is just like uh, immense. You know, uh, and, and again, one uh, barrier to effective care is inaccurate assessment. Uh, others include lack of trained healthcare professionals and social stigma associated with mental disorders. You probably remember back in the late 90s when uh, Surgeon General Satcher went around the country and he was exploring this idea of stigma. Uh, and it was all in the news uh, uh, back then. And, and one of his greatest surprises was that, and it's not going to be a surprise to anybody here, that older people uh, had uh, uh, just an enormous amount of stigma in terms of mental health, uh, particularly depression. Uh, that they don't want to talk about that. And, and I know you've had the opportunity of saying to an older person, gee, I'm wondering if you might be uh, depressed. And, and what they said again back in the 70s uh, was, oh, you think I'm crazy. Uh, and this just again happened uh, uh, several weeks ago when I was talking to an older person and I said, I'm wondering if you might be depressed. And, and again, it was just so, it was just, I thought, deja vu, uh, you know, uh, oh, you think I'm crazy, you think I'm out of my mind. And it was like, just the word depression is such a trigger, and yet, as I said earlier, we toss it around all the time. 
you know, uh, when we're not really talking about a clinical state of depression. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I think we have to look at the barriers, not only barriers in terms of our own work with people, but we have to look at the barriers in terms of older people themselves. What prevents them from really looking at this? Uh, and it's not that they're not bright, right? I mean, I think older people, by and large, are very bright, regardless of what their role was in life, uh, unless there's some kind of an organic uh, brain issue, a, a problem in some way. Uh, and, uh, you know, but there's this closed door, you know, uh, I don't want to talk about it, as Terence Real so aptly said. Uh, so we need to be aware of it. Uh, and also, we're going to see this massive growth in numbers of older people globally. Uh, and uh, the most common neuropsychiatric disorder in this age group uh, is going to be dementia and depression. Uh, and uh, so we need to be uh, aware of that. And, uh, and why don't we uh, close on this one and let's take our break. And if we could just do uh, about 15 minutes, I think we said, and uh, that would be 